Et in Sempiternum Periant by Charles Williams Narrated by Ulf Bjorklund Lord Argley came easily down the road. About him the spring was as gaudy as the restraint imposed by English geography ever lets it be. The last village lay a couple of miles behind him. As far in front, he had been told, was a main road on which he could meet a motor bus to carry him near his destination. A casual conversation in a club had revealed to him some months before that in a country house of England there were supposed to lie a few yet unpublished legal opinions of the Lord Chancellor Bacon. Lord Argley, being no longer Chief Justice, and having finished and published his History of Organic Law, had conceived that the editing of these papers might provide a pleasant variation upon his present business of studying the more complex parts of the Christian schoolmen. He had taken advantage of a weekend spent in the neighbourhood to arrange, by the goodwill of the owner, a visit of inspection. Since, as the owner had remarked, with a bitterness due to his financial problems, everything that is smoked isn't bacon, Lord Ardley had smiled. It hurt him a little to think that he had smiled, and said, which was true enough, that Bacon himself would not have made a better joke. It was a very deserted part of the country through which he was walking. He had been careful to follow the directions given him, and in fact there were only two places where he could possibly have gone wrong, and at both of them Lord Argley was certain he had not gone wrong. But he seemed to be taking a long time a longer time than he had expected. He looked at his watch again, and noted with sharp disapproval of his own judgment that it was only six minutes since he had looked at it last. It had seemed more like sixteen. Lord Argley frowned. He was usually a good walker, and on that morning he was not conscious of any unusual weariness. His host had offered to send him in a car, but he had declined. For a moment, as he put his watch back, he was almost sorry he had declined. A car would have made short time of this road, and at present his legs seemed to be making rather long time of it. Or, Lord Argley said aloud, making time rather long. He played a little as he went on, with a fancy that every road in space had a corresponding measure in time, that it tended merely of itself to hasten or delay all those who drove or walked upon it. The nature of some roads, quite apart from their material effectiveness, might urge men to speed, and of others to delay, so that the intentions of all travellers were counterpointed continually by the media they used. The courts, he thought, might reasonably take that into consideration in case of offences against right speed, and a man who accelerated upon one road would be held to have acted under the improper influence of the way, whereas one who did the same on another would be known to have defied and conquered the way. Lord Argley just stopped himself looking at his watch again. It was impossible that it should be more than five minutes since he had last done so. He looked back to observe, if possible, how far he had since come. It was not possible. The road narrowed and curved too much. There was a cloud of trees high up behind him. It must have been half an hour ago that he passed through it. Yet it was not merely still in sight, but the trees themselves were in sight. He could remark them as trees. He could almost, if he were a little careful, count them. He thought, with some irritation, that he must be getting old more quickly and more unnoticeably than he had supposed. He did not much mind about the quickness, but he did mind about the unnoticeableness. It had given him pleasure to watch the various changes which age tended to bring, to be as stealthy and as quick to observe those changes as they were to come upon him. The slower pace, the more meditative voice, the greater reluctance to decide, the inclination to fall back on habit, the desire for the familiar, which is the first skirmishing approach of unfamiliar death. He neither welcomed nor grudged such changes. He only observed them with a perpetual interest in the curious nature of the creation. The fantasy of growing old, like the fantasy of growing up, 
was part of the ineffable sweetness, touched with horror, of existence, itself the lordliest fantasy of all. But now, as he stood looking back over and across the hidden curves of the road, he felt suddenly that time had outmarched and outtwisted him, that it was spreading along the countryside and doubling back on him, so that it troubled and deceived his judgment. In an unexpected and unusual spasm of irritation, he put his hand to his watch again. He felt as if it were a quarter of an hour since he had looked at it. Very well, making just allowance for his state of impatience, he could expect the actual time to be five minutes. He looked. It was only two. Lord Argley made a small mental effort, and almost immediately recognized the effort. He said to himself, This is another mark of age. I am losing my sense of duration. He said also, It is becoming an effort to recognize these changes. Age was certainly quickening its work in him. It approached him now doubly. Not only his method of experience, but his awareness of experience was attacked. His knowledge of it comforted him. Perhaps, he thought, for the last time. The knowledge would go. He would savor it then while he could. Still looking back at the trees, it seems I'm decaying, Lord Ardley said aloud. And that, anyhow, is one up against decay. Am I procrastinating? I am, and in the circumstances procrastination is a proper and pretty game. It is a thief of time, and quite right, too. Why should time have it all its own way? He turned on the road again and went on. It passed now between open fields. In all those fields he could see no one. It was pasture, but there were no beasts. There was about him a kind of void in which he moved, hampered by this growing oppression of duration. Things lasted. He had exclaimed in his time against the too swift passage of the world. This was a new experience. It was lastingness. Almost, he could have believed, everlastingness. The measure of it was but his breathing, and his breathing, as it grew slower and heavier, would become the measure of everlasting labor. The labor of Sisyphus, who pushed his own slow heart through each infinite moment, and relaxed but to let it beat back, and so again begin. It was the first touch of something Argley had never yet known, of simple and perfect despair. At that moment he saw the house. The road before him curved sharply, and as he looked he wondered at the sweep of the curve. It seemed to make a full half-circle and so turn back in the direction that he had come. At the farthest point there lay before him, tangentially, another path. The sparse hedge was broken by an opening which was more than footpath and less than road. It was narrow, even when compared with the narrowing way by which he had come, yet hard and beaten as if by the passage of many feet. There had been innumerable travellers, and all solitary, all on foot. No cars or carts could have taken that path. If there had been burdens, they had been carried on the shoulders of their owners. It ran for no long distance, no more than in happier surroundings might have been a garden path from gate to door. There, at the end, was the door. Argley at that time took all this in but half-consciously. His attention was not on the door, but on the chimney. The chimney, in the ordinary phrase, was smoking. It was smoking effectively and continuously. A narrow and dense pillar of dusk poured up from it, through which there glowed every now and then a deeper undershade of crimson as if some trapped genie almost thrust itself out of the moving prison that held it. The house itself was not much more than a cottage. There was a door, shut, on the left of it a window, also shut, above two little attic windows, shut, and covered within by some sort of dark hanging, or perhaps made opaque by smoke that filled the room. There was no sign of life anywhere and the smoke continued to mount to the lifeless sky. It seemed to Argley curious that he had not noticed this grey pillar in his approach, that only now when he stood almost in the straight and narrow path 
leading to the house, did it become visible. An exposition of tall darkness reserved to the solitary walkers upon that wearying road. Lord Argley was the last person in the world to look for responsibilities. He shunned them by a courteous habit. A responsibility had to present itself with a delicate emphasis before he acceded to it. But when any so impressed itself, he was courteous in accepting as in declining. He sought friendship with necessity, and as young lovers call their love fatal, so he turned fatality of life into his love. It seemed to him, as he stood and gazed at the path, the shut door, the smoking chimney, that here perhaps was a responsibility being delicately emphatic. If everyone was out, if the cottage had been left for an hour, ought he to do something? Of course they might be busy about it within, in which case a thrusting stranger would be inopportune. Another glow of crimson in the pillar of cloud decided him. He went up the path. As he went, he glanced at the little window, but it was bluffed by dirt. He could not very well see whether the panes did or did not hide smoke within. When he was so near the threshold that the window had almost passed out of his vision, he thought he saw a face looking out of it, at the extreme edge nearest the door. And he checked himself and went back a step to look again. It had been only along the side of his glance that the face, if face it were, had appeared, a kind of sudden white scrawl against the blur, as if it were a mask hung by the window rather than any living person, or as if the glass of the window itself had looked sideways at him, and he had caught the look without understanding its cause. When he stepped back, he could see no face. Had there been a sun in the sky, he would have attributed the apparition to a trick of the light. But in the sky over this smoking house there was no sun. It had shone brightly that morning when he had started. It had paled and faded and finally been lost to him as he had passed along his road. There was neither sun nor peering face. He stepped back to the threshold and knocked with his knuckles on the door. There was no answer. He knocked again and again waited, and as he stood there he began to feel annoyed. The balance of Lord Argley's mind had not been achieved without the creation of a considerable counter-energy to the violence of Lord Argley's natural temper. There had been people whom he had once come very near hating, hating with a fury of selfish rage and detestation, for instance his brother-in-law. His brother-in-law had not been a nice man. Lord Argley, as he stood by the door, and, for no earthly reason, remembered him, admitted it. He admitted at the same moment that no lack of niceness on that other's part could excuse any indulgence of vindicative hate on his own, nor could he think why, then and there, he wanted him, wanted to have him merely to hate. His brother-in-law was dead. Lord Argley almost regretted it. Almost he desired to follow, to be with him, to provoke and torment him, to... Lord Argley struck the door again. There is, he said to himself, entire clarity and the omnipotence. It was his habit of devotion, his means of recalling himself into peace out of the angers, greeds, sloths, and perversities that still too often possessed him. It operated. The temptation passed into the benediction of the omnipotence and disappeared. But there was still no answer from within. Lord Argley laid his hand on the latch. He swung the door and, lifting his hat with his other hand, looked into the room. A room empty of smoke as of fire, and of all as of both. Its size and appearance were those of a rather poor cottage, rather indeed a large brick hut than a cottage. It seemed much smaller within than without. There was a fireplace. At least there was a place for a fire on his left. Opposite the door, against the right-hand wall, there was a ramshackle flight of wooden steps going up to the attics, and at its foot, swinging on a broken hinge, a door which gave away presumably to a cellar. Vaguely, 
Argley found himself surprised. He had not supposed that a dwelling of this sort would have a cellar. Indeed, from where he stood, he could not be certain. It might only be a cupboard. But, unwarrantably, it seemed more a hinted unseen depth, as if the slow, slight movement of the broken wooden door measured that labor of Sisyphus, as if the road ran past him and went coiling spirally into the darkness of the cellar. In the room there was no furniture, neither fragment of paper nor broken bit of wood. There was no sign of life, no flame in the grate, no drift of smoke in the air. It was completely and utterly void. Lord Argley looked at it. He went back a few steps and looked up again at the chimney. Undoubtedly the chimney was smoking. It was received into a pillar of smoke. There was no clear point where the dark chimney ended and the dark smoke began. Howes leaned to roof, roof to chimney, chimney to smoke, and smoke went up for ever and ever over those roads where men crawled infinitely through the smallest measurements of time. Argley returned to the door, crossed the threshold, and stood in the room. Empty of flame? Empty of flame's material, holding within its dank air the very opposite of flame, the chill of ancient years. The room lay round him. Lord Argley contemplated it. There's no smoke without fire, he said aloud. Only apparently there is. Thus one lives and learns, unless indeed this is the place where one lives without learning. The phrase leaving his lips sounded oddly about the walls and in the corners of the room. He was suddenly revolted by his own chance words. A place where one lives without learning. Where no courtesy or integrity could any more be defined or clarified. The echo daunted him. He made a sharp movement. He took a step aside towards the stairs, and before the movement was complete, was aware of a change. A dank chill became a concentration of dank and deadly heat pricking at him, entering his nostrils and his mouth. The fantasy of life without knowledge materialized, inimicable in the air, life without knowledge, corrupting life without knowledge, jungle, and less than jungle. And though still the walls of the bleak chamber met his eyes, a shell of existence, it seemed that life, withdrawn from all those normal habits of which the useless memory was still drearily sustained, by the thin phenomenal fabric, was collecting and corrupting in the atmosphere behind the door he had so rashly passed. Outside the other door, which swung crookedly at the head of the darker hole within. He had recoiled from the heat, but not so as to escape it. He had even taken a step or two up the stairs, when he heard from without a soft approach. Light feet were coming up the beaten path to the house. Some other good Samaritan, Argley thought, who would be able to keep his toppins in his pocket. For certainly, whatever was the explanation of all this, and wherever it lay, in the attics above or in the pit of the cellar below, responsibility was gone. Lord Argley did not conceive that either he or anyone else need rush about the country in an anxious effort to preserve a house which no one wanted and no one used. Prematurely enjoying the discussion, he waited. Through the doorway, someone came in. It was, or seemed to be, a man of ordinary height wearing some kind of loose, dark overcoat that flapped about him. His head was bare, so, astonishingly, were his legs and feet. At first, as he stood just inside the door, leaning greedily forward. His face was invisible, and for a moment Argley hesitated to speak. Then the stranger lifted his face, and Argley uttered a sound. It was emaciated beyond imagination. It was astonishing, at the appalling degree of hunger revealed, that the man could walk or move at all, or even stand as he was now doing and turned that dreadful skull from side to side. Argley came down the steps of the stair in one jump. He cried out again. He ran forward, and as he did so, 
The deep, burning eyes in the turning face of bone met his full and halted him. They did not see him, or if they saw, did not notice. They gazed at him and moved on. Once only in his life had Arglay seen eyes remotely like those. Once when he had pronounced the death sentence upon a wretched man who had broken under the long strain of his trial and filled the court with shrieks, madness had glared at Lord Arglay from that dock. But at least it had looked at him and seen him. These eyes did not. They sought something, food, life, or perhaps only a form and something to hate. And in that energy the stranger moved. He began to run around the room. The bones that were his legs and feet jerked up and down. The head turned from side to side. He ran circularly, round and again round, crossing and recrossing, looking up, down, around, and at last, right in the center of the room, coming to a halt, where, as if some terrible pain of starvation gripped him, he bent and twisted downward until he squatted grotesquely on the floor. There, squatting and bending, he lowered his head and raised his arm. And as the fantastic black coat slipped back, Arglay saw a wrist, saw it marked with scars. He did not at first think what they were, only when the face and wrist of the figure swaying in its pain came together did he suddenly know. They were teeth marks, they were bites. The mouth closed on the wrist and gnawed. Argley cried out and sprang forward, catching the arm, trying to press it down, catching the other shoulder, trying to press it back. He achieved nothing. He held, he felt, he grasped, he could not control. The long limb remained raised. The fierce teeth gnawed. But as Argley bent, he was aware once more of that effluvia of heat risen round him and breaking up with a more violence, when suddenly the man, if it were a man, cast his arm away, and with a jerk of movement rose once more to his feet. His eyes, as the head went back, burned close into Arglay's, who, what with the heat, the eyes, and his sickness at the horror, shut his own against them, and was at the same moment thrown from his balance by the rising form, and sent staggering a step or two away, with upon his face the sensation of a light, hot breath, so light that only in the utter stillness of time could it be felt, so hot that it might have been the inner fire from which the pillar of smoke poured outward to the world. He recovered his balance. He opened his eyes. Both motions brought him into a new corner of that world. The odd black coat the thing had worn had disappeared, as if it had been a covering imagined by a habit of mind. The thing itself, a wasted flicker of pallid movement, danced and gyrated in white flame before him. Arglay saw it still, but only now as a dreamer may hear, half asleep and half awake, the sound of dogs barking, or the crackling of fire in his very room. For he opened his eyes, not to such things, but to the thing that on the threshold of this place some seconds earlier or some years, he had felt and been pleased to feel to the reality of his hate. It came in a rush within him, a fountain of fire, and without and about him images of the man he hated swept in a thick cloud of burning smoke. The smoke burned his eyes and choked his mouth. He clutched it at images within it, at his greedy loves and greedy hates, at the cloud of the sin of his life yearning to catch but one image and renew again the concentration for which he yearned. He could not. The smoke blinded and stifled him. Yet more than stifling or blinding was the hunger for one true thing to lust or hate. He was starving in the smoke, and all the hut was full of smoke, for the hut and the world were smoke pouring up around him, from him, and all like him, a thing once holy and still a little made visible to his corporeal eyes in forms which they recognized, but in itself of another nature. He swung and twisted and crouched, his limbs ached from long wrestling with the smoke, for as the journey to this place had prolonged itself infinitely, so now 
though he had no thought of measurement. The clutch of his hands and the growing sickness that invaded him struck through him the sensation of the passage of years and the knowledge of the passage of moments. The fire sank within him, and the sickness grew, but the change could not bring him nearer to any end. The end here was not at the end, but in the beginning. There was no end to this smoke, to this fever, and to this chill, to crouching and rising and searching, unless the end was now. Now, now was the only possible other fact, chance, act. He cried out, defying infinity, now. Before his voice, the smoke of his prison yielded, and yielded two ways at once. From where he stood, he could see in one place an alteration in that perpetual gray, an alternate darkening and lightening, as if two ways of descent and ascent met. There was, he remembered, a way in, therefore a path out. He had only to walk along it. But also there was a way still farther in, and he could walk along that. Two doors had swung to his outer senses in that small room. From every gate of hell there was a way to heaven. Yes, and in every way to heaven there was a gate to a deeper hell. Yet for a moment he hesitated. There was no sign of the phenomenon by which he had discerned the passage of that other spirit. He desired, very strongly he desired, to be of use to it. He desired to offer himself to it, to make a ladder of himself, if that should be desired by which it might perhaps mount from the nature of the lost, from the dereliction of all minds that refuse living and learning, postponement and irony, whose dwelling is necessarily in their undying and perishing selves. Slowly, unconsciously, he moved his head as if to seek his neighbor. He saw, at first he felt, nothing. His eyes returned to that vibrating oblong of an imagined door, the heart of the smoke beating in the smoke. He looked at it. He remembered the way. He was on the point of movement when the stinging heat struck him again, but this time from behind. It leapt through him. He was seized in it and loosed from it. Its rush abandoned him. The torrent of its fiery passage struck the darkening hollow in the walls. At the instant that it struck, there came a small sound there floated up a thin, shrill pipe, too short to hear, too certain to miss, faint and quick, as from some single insect in the hedgerow or the field, and yet more than single, a weak wail of multitudes of the lost. The shrill lament struck his ears, and he ran. He cried as he sprang, Now is God, now is glory God! and as the dark door swung before him, it was the threshold of the house that received his flying feet. As he passed, another form slipped by him, slinking hastily into the house, another of the hordes going so swiftly up that straight way, hard with everlasting time, each driven by his own hunger, and each alone. The vision, a face looking in as a face had looked out, was gone running still but more lightly now, and with some communion of peace at heart, Argley came into the curving road. The trees were all about him. The house was at their heart. He ran on through them. Beyond, he saw, he reached the spring day and the sun. At a little distance, a motor bus, gaudy within and without, was coming down the road. The driver saw him. Lord Argley instinctively made a sign, ran, mounted, as he sat down, breathless and shaken. Ikindi Ushimo, his mind said. Arrivedir Lastel. The End Hi, this is Ulf. Thank you for listening to Et in Sempiternum Periant by Charles Williams, an Ulf VO production. For more information, go to ulfvo.com. And for more of my titles, you can find me at audible.com by searching for Ulf Björklund. Thank you.